themselves, but luckily for Florida State, defense is something that they are always good at. First pitch up and outside. Home plate umpire today is Don Brown alongside Cameron Ellison and Matt Dial. It's a South Alabama team that's really potent offensively. Struggled a little bit last weekend, only one and three. But Becky Clark knows that their ceiling is a lot higher than that record would indicate. And last weekend, they did face LSU twice. That was two of the losses. And they've got a very solid pitching staff as well. But Abby Allen, sitting in that number two slot, had a great weekend. Two extra base hits, one for a home run, and the triple on the weekend. Really good job, but has to be in go mode, according to Coach Clark, to get this offense going. It's a one-two count early to Caroline Nichols, the designated player for USA. They call her Pepper Nichols, which goes back to when she was a young in and she wore a Dr. Pepper shirt for about a week straight to a softball camp, and it's stuck ever since. Pepper, such a good name for a leadoff hitter. But it's Sander Cock who starts with a strikeout today. Yeah, Sander Cock just fills the zone. She does such a good job of trying to define the corners early in a game. Typically, you see that drop ball, but there, a little screw ball on the outside corner for the look and the first out of the game. Brings in Abby Allen, who was so great last weekend for the Jags. Talking to Coach Clark, she said her team just came out flat last weekend, really needed to be more aggressive early in the count, find the right strikes. But Sander Cock going to fill the bottom of the zone. There's that drop ball again. Really good job of just trying to define the strike zone early in the game. She does not throw a ton of balls in the dirt, but she will definitely push the corners and try to figure out where the strikes will be called today and then just push the envelope as she gets ahead in the count. Catches the outside edge. It's one and two again. Not really overpowering Sandra Cock, but like you said, I mean, she's so effective, Jenny. Definitely, because she knows how to nip corners. Good pitchers are able to throw strikes that don't look like strikes. She's able to just bend it through the zone and nip that corner again. A beautiful pitch, a second looking strikeout on the day. That's where. Sander Cock is the most effective, just down in the zone, finding the corners, and right now stymieing the offense for South Alabama. Sander Cock wasting no time picking up where she left off last year when she was 27 and 4, a minuscule ERA of 128. First team All ACC, second team All American, all tournament team in the College World Series. Just a banner season for FSU's ace. Well, and this week, Coach Alameda said, you know, she was feeling a little under the weather, so I didn't expect to actually see her start here today. But definitely a gamer going to bring that drop ball to this one. And that's just a nasty spot. You saw in her first swing, Kvistad went after that pitch on the outside. But now with an 0-2, Sander Cock is not going to bring anything close to the zone. Camden Cavista, the catcher, barely gets a piece. Maybe the best player on this South Alabama team, Cavista. Well, and she comes from good softball stock. Her sister played at Florida, and when we asked her about it, we said, you know, is there a lot of comparisons? She said, no, we're two very different players, and we just are a very competitive family. Rope right at area 24, and Sydney Sherrill. Here's a hint. Don't hit it over there if you want to get on base. One, two, three for Sander Cock in the top of the first. FSU to the dish next. Day for softball in the panhandle at Joanne Graff Field in Tallahassee, mid-70s. The sun is out. FSU at home, 4-0 in the opening weekend. Seminoles to the plate now after a 1-2-3 from Kat Sandercock. They'll face Jenna Hardy for South Alabama. 
Yeah, Jenna Hardy became the number two last season when Allie Hewen went down with injury, but developed her confidence in all of those starts. She relies on her curveball, but throws a screw, a rise, and a drop as well. An effective changeup led to a quality opening weekend through the most innings on staff and is going to have to really nip those corners to be effective against these null hitters. Junior out of White House, Ohio. She'll have her hands full today with an FSU team that came out guns blazing last weekend with a 35-2 combined margin and a 4-0 start. Right off the bat, Janai Kerr swings at the first pitch, right back to Hardy for the first out. You've got to love a pitcher that can field her position. Hardy does a really good job on that comebacker. Quick first out of the game, but that's what they're going to need. Fill the zone with strikes, allow the defense to play and keep the ball in the park. Brings in Kaylee Mudge. Kind of a microcosm of Florida State's bats last weekend. Didn't expect a lot of power from her, but at her first career bomb in the season opener last weekend, and that's really the story for FSU one weekend in, is outside the top 100 in the major statistical categories last year on offense, still made it all the way to the final weekend. And now if they can really add some power, Jenny, they're maybe the most dangerous team in the country. Well, and the crazy part about last season is even it going into the ACC tournament, Coach, uh, Coach Alameda was talking about how they had not really defined what their scoring mechanisms were. They had relied on power for so many seasons, and last year the long ball evaded them. Only 47 home runs on the season. Mudge, not one of them. However, getting that first one last weekend. Just inside from Hardy to Mudge, who is a primetime player. 14 hits in the College World Series last year. That is an all-time record, including five in one game against Montana Fouts in Alabama. She really was unstoppable, Drew, last year at the Women's College World Series. She hit 500, for crying out loud, against the best pitching in the nation. I mean, Kaylee Mudge and then Batten was able to just keep defensively strong out there and left, came away with some key catches, and just Florida State was impressive there in that championship series against Oklahoma. She is the first base runner today, draws the walk from Hardy. Second complete, number 13, Nack Litter. Here's someone to be really excited about if you're a Florida State softball fan. Mac Leonard, the transfer from Illinois State. Another Seminole who hit the long ball in the opening weekend. She's a two-way player with a lot of pop at the dish, and now she's got a runner in scoring position as Mudge goes from first to second. Little eagle swoop. That'll be what you see all year long on stolen bases for Florida State. But when it comes to speed, Mudge there at the top of the lineup puts themselves, puts Florida State in scoring position with her wheels. Second stolen base of the year, went one for two in the opening weekend. 1-0 to Leonard. Down low, 2-0. Leonard last weekend. How's this for a first impression with your new team? Started all four games, seven of 10 at the plate, plus two walks, on base percentage of 750, and hit the deep ball in her first game with the Seminoles. Well, that's what you're looking for. When you go into the transfer portal as a coach, you're looking for someone who is able to bring not just experience, but also maturity. This team needed someone to sit at the top of the lineup with those seniors, such as Sydney Sherrill and Devin Flaherty. This is a young team, honestly, because of how much grad, how many starters graduated last season. So to be able to go into the portal and find a player like Mac Leonard, I mean, that's a gold mine. Already saw one mound visit from Kavistad to Hardy. Keep an eye on that. That one's in there on the lower edge of the zone. New rule this year, only seven player conferences allowed per game. And you know, you got to use one early when you got Kaylee Mudge at second base already. Three 
one is downstairs and Leonard walks for the third time this year. I actually really like that choice of pitch though. A changeup coming in in that 3-1 count kept it down in the zone. A changeup that gets elevated is one that'll get you in trouble. So I like that Hardy left this one down in the zone. Just a little bit too low though puts Leonard on first. Kaylee Harding, the right fielder, batting cleanup today. Takes strike one. Harding, another player, as I sound like a broken record already, who hit a home run in the season opener against Mercer. Six for the Seminoles in total from six different players in that opening weekend. Ground ball to second base. Bell Wolfenen can't handle it cleanly, but does get Leonard at second. Mudge moves over to third, Harding at first. And in this arena, you have to be able to make the routine play. There, a little miscue at second base by Wolfenden, but still able to come away with an out. It does put runners on the corners, and now Florida State just 60 feet away from their first run. And here is Sydney Sherrill. Yes, she is still playing for Florida State, and she takes ball one. This is her. 227th career start for the Seminoles. See Harding at second base, advanced on that last pitch. Last year, Cheryl just two home runs, but her average is the thing that makes her so important. She, her extra base hits actually come on a ton of doubles. She led the ACC in doubles a season ago. She hits another one in the gap here. That can be two runs. 1-1 one, one is lifted in foul territory in between three Jaguars. It'll make it one and two on Cheryl. The doubles are the key for her, Jenny. 66 in her career, most in program history. And her, I mean, her career accolades list is enough to fill up a full page of the media guide. That might be the most impressive number, 66 doubles. Yeah, there's not enough time to go on and on about all of the things that Sydney Sherrill is good at, but she's just been a solid player ever since, since she stepped on campus. One, two from Hardy. One of the craziest things about Sydney Sherrill is after her freshman fall, she wasn't having fun anymore. She walked away from that fall thinking she may not want to play softball anymore. And Coach Alameda said, go home and figure it out. She came back, realized she loved the game, and they've had Sydney Sherrill for a while. 2-2 yeah, two -two ripped into right field. First run comes home with Mudge, and Harding taps home as well. Sydney Sherrill doing Sydney Sherrill things. And when it comes to being so good, it's about finding the opportunity to score runs when they're sitting just 60 feet away. This one, sharp line drive out into right field. Mudge fast enough to come in on that one, but check it out. Not just one run will come across, but two. Speed at second, scores all the way, and a little miscue by South Alabama gives Florida State the 2 nothing lead. Brings in Michaela Edenfield, another really exciting player on this FSU team, the true freshman out of Sneeds, Florida. But again, it's a 2-2 count for Sydney Sherrill with two runners in scoring position and two outs. Those are the situations where FSU made their money last year. That's how they got all the way to the final. Yeah, it wasn't bombs. It was coming through with timely hitting, and they were able to do it there at the end of the year. Another stolen base attempt, and Sherrill is safe. That was tight. Camden Kavistad with a nice throw to second, but the Eagle continues to swoop at Joanne Graf Field. Yeah, that was a really good transfer by Kavistad back behind the dish. Good receive, throws from her knees, throws on target, but check out how deep the slide is. That's the difference in this one. She slides to the back of the bag, and the tag tries to follow Cheryl rather than going back to that back corner to get Cheryl out. You know, there's two parts to every stolen base. It's not just the receive and throw by the catcher, but it's the receive and tag by the defender up the middle. Those tags, you cannot go for the body or go for the runner. You have to take the tag back to the bag to be able to get the foot or the hand trying to sneak their way in. 
Keep in mind, no replay review here today. That is a big topic of conversation heading into this year. This stolen base doesn't end up mattering as Hardy gets at infield looking, but it is a two-zip FSU lead after one. Sydney Sherrill. Attention last season. There was actually a bold prediction by Amanda Scarborough in the Seven Innings podcast saying that she could see three of these teams in the ACC potentially making it to the Women's College World Series. Yeah, I was listening to that I don't podcast. Know if I and yeah, Amanda I don't was know immediately if... roasted. Um, <laughs> but it's it's called bold for a reason, you know. You got to make your bold predictions. Do you think that there's a possibility of that happening, though? Three teams from this league. It really comes down to where do they end up in regionals and super regionals. Kennedy Cronin leads it off for South Alabama. Top two against Catherine Sandercock. And it's another put out for Florida State and Brooke Blankenship, the freshman Next at shortstop. Up, FSU very sure-handed defensively, as they always are. It's one of the hallmarks of Lonnie Alameda's teams. Going back to that conversation about the ACC strength, Jenny, three teams in the College World Series, I mean, that, that would be shocking. Another first pitch swing for South. Victoria Ortiz grounds out to Devin Flaherty. Two up, two down on two pitches. Well, it seems as though the message of Coach Clark at South Alabama, we need to be ready on every pitch, rang true with this team. They went back to basics last week, or this week, after kind of a flat performance last weekend at LSU. They're being very aggressive on early pitches, which is where you need to be with Sander Cock, who likes to extend the zone when she gets ahead. Bell Wolfenden also swings at the first pitch. That's now 15 pitches for Sandercock. 13 of them have been strikes. Definitely very effective on the zone. Fills the corners, extends the zone up and down. But right now, she's just living down in the bottom of the zone. One fouled off again, just pounding that natural sound microphone up near the net. She stays in that area. She's going to have an invoice on her hands. <laughs> I'm sure that Lonnie Alameda would pay that gladly. <laughs> <laughs> Another 0-2 count for Katherine Sandercock. Bell Wolfenden played in 51 of 52 for USA last season. Our Jaguars team that went back to a regional played in Gainesville. First NCAA tournament appearance since 2015 for the Jags. Another 0-2 from Sandercock. Popped up. Devin Flaherty is sure-handed as per usual. One, two, three, first and second inning. Catherine Sandercock with a vintage performance so far. Florida State, autumn two at Joanne Graff Field. Devin Flaherty, Bethany Keene, Brooke Blankenship against Jenna Hardy in the circle for South Alabama. It was a two RBI single for Sydney Sherrill, the super senior for FSU, that gave the Seminoles an early two zip lead. Flaherty, the starting second baseman, takes strike one from Hardy. Flaherty brings a ton of speed here as the leadoff hitter in this inning. She's done such a good job of just figuring out how to be good at the plate and then use her wheels on the bases. No one slapped to the left side. Got her in time. Nice play from Kennedy Cronin at short for South Alabama. Hey, folks, we've got another great women's hoops doubleheader tomorrow night right here on ACC Network in the ESPN app with Pitt and Miami at 6 Eastern. We're featuring the second game, top 20 matchup. Number 19, Notre Dame. Number 16, Georgia Tech. Both 10 and 4 in the conference, trailing NC State, Louisville, and one game behind Virginia Tech. It should be a great one. 
And number 19, Notre Dame, has the ACC Freshman of the Week for the sixth time this season, Sonia Citroen. And I tell you what, young talent is obviously one of those things that the ACC is known for because they're, they've got a ton of it here on this Florida State squad as well. Unbelievably professional segue there from, from Jenny Dalton Hill. Young broadcasters take notes. That's how it's done. I mean, you got to prep the promos too. You're prepping for a show, not just a game. That's right. But more than anything, I mean, young talent, that's what every coach is looking for. This is Bethany Keene, bloops it to second. And another bang, bang play at first. Nice job by Bell Wolfenden at second for USA, two down. As a second baseman, you really need to charge this one hard. I would have rather seen her come up and really short hop that one rather than sit back. That's much too close. It's a really good out for the second out of the inning. But honestly, as a second baseman, you want to try to pick that ball out of the air. And if you're not, you need to short hop it, not sit back and let it play you. And speaking of that young talent, Jenny, Brooke Blankenship is here, a freshman out of Hudson, Florida. Depending on where you looked, she was maybe a top five recruit in the class of 2021. A lot of talent for this young shortstop. Well, Josie Muffley, the shortstop of note last season, still on the squad, but Blankenship has shown up and been able to earn that starting spot. She's another one of those home runs from a week ago that you had talked about, six Seminoles with home runs last weekend. You know, when she was nine years old, she went to the Super Regional, watched FSU come back, beat Michigan twice to move on to the Women's College World Series. She's got Seminole in her blood. I think it was a pretty easy decision for her to choose FSU. One-two from Hardy. Blankenship stays alive. Well, Drew, I think the thing that has made such an impact on these young players is the ability to see softball at a young age and quality softball at a young age not just being able to see it on tv but be able to visit campuses and go watch super regionals there are so many opportunities now for young girls to see what they want to be this one stays fair out to right tracked down there by victoria ortiz so it's a one, two, three second for Jenna Hardy in South Alabama. They've got seven, eight, nine due in the top of the third. We were playing softball here in Clearwater. The amount of great matchups that we have here are unparalleled. Coming on to make the diving catch. Wow, just really big plays. Back to the track and gone. The best ticket, the hardest ticket to get in town. Is that called an umbrella or a parasol, technically? I'm not sure, but you can bring one of those with you to St. Pete Clearwater. Check out some of the best softball you'll find anywhere. Women's College World Series ends the year with a bang. This really begins the year with a bang. You see 40 games over four days, all of it happening here in the ESPN family of networks. Some of the best teams in the country are going to be down there in Florida. We get the chance to call some of them, Jenny, and we're all so excited here with ESPN. Yeah, and I'm sure that's the secret he's telling her. You know what? Are you going to watch games this weekend? I'm watching games <laughs> this weekend. But honestly, if you love softball, this is the perfect February afternoon, February weekend, because so many quality games on TV. South it's Alabama. Kind of like bookend, right? Like bookend yeah. the season, because you start with what is almost a championship feel at the beginning of the year and you cap it off in June with the Women's College World Series. Becky Clark's Jaguars team going to be spending a lot of time in Florida here. No, they're actually on the road for the first month plus of the season. Their first home game isn't until a month from today, March 16th. They're spending some time in Florida going over to Leesburg after this one in Tallahassee. Meanwhile, the Knowles will be going to Clearwater St. Pete area. Bailey Welch, the sophomore out of Hueytown, Alabama, leading things off in the top of the third. And Catherine Sandercock continues to deal. 
And the one thing that co pitching coaches around the country, their new buzzword is tunneling. They want their pitchers to have their pitches stay on like a tunnel the long, longer they... The, I'm just going to bumble off. It's my a word. new buzzword. <laughs> it's a new buzzword. <laughs> Sander Cock puts Welch away on the swinging strikeout, her third of the day. You want your pitches to tunnel in the same plane as long as possible before that late sharp break. Sander Cock does a really good job of, with that drop ball of mixing it up in terms of which corner she puts it on, but just falling under the barrel of the Jaguar hitters. So really, I mean, tunneling is just kind of another word for for an illusion almost, right? You want the batter to think it's one pitch and then it kind of becomes a different pitch at the last second. Well, what you want is the pitch to come in on that same exact spot and then break into its rise, drop, curve, screw, whatever it is. But you want it to break as late as possible to try to deceive the hitter's eye and make their contact point a little bit off. You know, it's even more crucial for a pitcher like Sandercock, who, as, as we've talked about, not overpowering velocity, going to live in that mid to high 60s range, but wins with her control and her spin. Time called by the home plate umpire, Don Brown, as Meredith Keel, the starting third baseman, is in there against Sandercock. Count one and two to the right state transfer. A yeah, really nice pitch, but Keel steps in as the leading hitter from this South Alabama squad. Led the team in offense with a 365 average a year ago, but not a ton of power, so she's looking to use speed to get, up, get herself on. Fastball upstairs, two and two. Yeah, Keel hit 429 in Sunbelt Conference play last year, Jenny. First team all league player hitting in the eight hole here for head coach Becky Clark. Why do you think she bats her there? Well, with a ton of speed and a lot of confidence down at the bottom of the lineup, she turns it over for some of those bigger hitters that then sit at the top of the lineup. So her speed, very valuable sitting down here. Got a piece, but Edenfield hangs on behind the dish. Four strikeouts for Kat Sandercock. At just a beautiful spot. That Screwball outside corner. It's a great pitch to slappers because they have to stay in the box. Keel does a really good job of keeping that left foot in the box, but because of that, that pitch away or that screwball from Sandercock, hard to reach. Brings in the nine hole hitter, Mackenzie Brasher for South Alabama. Continuing with that Rise trend, ball. Jenny. Yeah, there, there's a rise ball for you. Surprised to see that? No, because she's got to throw it. She has to develop it. It has to not be a waste pitch. Typically, you'll see that pitch when she's ahead in the count, but I like that she started this hitter with a ball up in the zone. Pitching backwards a little bit to Brasher, who was second team all conference last year. 2 0, oh, so Keel first team all SBC last year. Brasher second team all SBC. Maybe the most dangerous bottom of the lineup in the country for USA here. Well, and Brasher, just a career best stats in 2021. Great average, able to just do so much and drew another runner, another batter with speed as well. Count runs to two and one. And Coach Clark was telling us that, you know, the beautiful thing about being as fast as Mackenzie Brasher is you can make mistakes and get away with it. Coach Clark said, when I miss hit the ball, I was out by 10 steps. McKenzie is safe by two. Yeah, I was along the lines of Coach Clark, not McKenzie Brasher. <laughs> but when it comes to Brasher, she just needs to get the ball on the ground. Sometimes the biggest deficit a slapper has is when they elevate a ball because there's not much you can do to beat that out when the ball's just lifted and it's a catch. So a good slapper is able to find not just holes, but find ways to put the ball on the ground and beat it out. 2-2. Two -two. 
Over to Cheryl. Easy money for FSU. Nine up, nine down in the first three innings for Catherine Sandercock. Top of the order due for FSU. Afternoon softball at Joanne Graff Field in Tallahassee, Florida State. Fresh off a trip to the Women's College World Series Championship Series last year. 4-0 to start the opening weekend last weekend. They lead 2-zip here against South Alabama at home. Janai Kerr starts things off. The leadoff hitter who swung at the first pitch last time does it again. And it's a bloop to the second baseman, Bell Wolfenden. And typically as a leadoff hitter, you see players that take a lot of pitches, are a little bit more aggressive down in the zone, especially as they step in as slappers. But so far, very aggressive at the top of the lineup, Kerr. Brings in Kaylee Mudge, who scored the first run of the game after she walked in the bottom of the first. On this time of year, Drew, Coaches are looking and manipulating lineups. You may not see the same lineup from day to day in terms of leadoff batter, who's going to hit in the four hole, defensive positioning. And so this time of year, yes, you have your starters potentially, but coaches are really searching for what the right makeup is to be able to make long runs in the deep in the postseason. Yeah, we talked with Coach Lonnie Al Alameda a couple times before this game and last week she was saying you know we'll start with an A team but 15 games later the A team could be a lot different you know you just don't know what your lineup is going to look like in June right now. And a lot of that has to do with how you hit because most coaches will tell you if you can hit you will play so it comes down to offense are you able to produce at the plate because if you can there's going to be a spot for you defensively. We know Kaylee Mudge can produce at the plate. What a pleasant surprise she was for FSU last year. Hit 333 and got better as the season went on and the lights got brighter. That one is smashed down the right field line, just foul. Almost her second home run of the season after she had none coming in. I love the power that Mudge is showing, but what that is is confidence. Being able to turn on a pitch on the inside. Sometimes you'll see a slapper just put balls down and run them out, but Mudge really showing confidence in that swing. This time she goes the other way on a liner, and that is going to be a base knock as Bailey Welch can't bring it in. Kaylee Mudge finds herself at second after another double. Are you looking at the new leadoff hitter potentially for Florida State? I mean, Mudge doing such a good job in the two spot. Kerr has not been able to figure it out in the leadoff slot, but Mudge stepping in, she's got power, she's got speed, and right now finding a way to do a really good job just getting a barrel squared up. This could have been an amazing play out there and left by Bailey Welch, but it hits the heel of her glove and bounces away. That thing was coming in hot. It had some mustard on it. Maybe a little catch up too. Over to first base, Mac Leonard is put away by Abby Allen. Mudge moves over to third. Nice play by Allen at first. That one had ketchup, mustard, and maybe some relish on it. Maybe some sauerkraut too. <laughs> I tell you what, Mac Leonard is a big time hitter. So uh, good job gloving that one up to get the out. So two down for the cleanup hitter, Kaylee Harding. He scored that second run back in the first. Jenna Hardy's first pitch outside. Yeah, Harding Just is to give a you. great right fielder. She's got a cannon for an arm that has made some top 10 plays already this year. But when it comes to Harding, she's in the lineup because of her bat. So like we were talking about, if you can hit, you will play. Not only is she a great defender, but Kaylee Harding, great hitter. Now she has got a cannon, like you said, Jenny. She gunned down a runner from right all the way to third against Loyola last weekend. She was number nine on SportsCenter's top 10. 
That one looped out to right and down. Here comes Mudge. It's another run for the Seminoles. Kaylee Harding brings her home. Three zip FSU. Yeah, that hit probably didn't feel great off the bat. Off the end of the bat, probably wrung her hand a little bit, but it was a seeing eye single out there to right. Finds its way to the grass, and because of the speed, there it is. Another run for Florida State. Sydney Sherrill steps in. She had the two ribbies back in the first. But just to give you an idea of the depth on this FSU roster, you know, we talked about Harding, how good she is with the bat, how great her arm is out in right field. Talking with Coach A before the season, she used the word battle to describe how it's going to be for playing time out and right. They've got a really talented freshman in Hallie Waycaser who we haven't seen a whole lot of yet this year. We should see her some more this weekend in St. Pete. Got such a great blend of veterans and youngsters on this roster. Well, and it's a very healthy culture as well with the veterans really taking the freshmen under their wing, but also the veterans being okay with the freshmen pushing them and sometimes beating them out. Cheryl sends that one, foul territory left field. That'll be two and two. Why do you think that the culture is that way? What, what about Coach A's personality makes that trickle down? Well, the thing that was really impressive when we talked to her before this game was she said she had brought everybody in and they had had a lot of talks about where do you see yourself? What, what about your week weekend? There's the speed again. No need for a slide, but she shows off that slide <laughs> in the second base. Another. Stolen base, some soaring eagles for Florida State. Fourth you know, the they're day. known for those, the stolen bases. 117 last year. I mean, look to see those kinds of video game numbers put up by Florida State again this season. Three, two to Cheryl. Rounder left side, shortstop Cronin is on it. Over to first, that'll do it for the third inning. Another run for the Seminoles. Kaylee Harding brings home Kaylee Mudge, talking with Coach A in the top of the fourth when we come back. Back at Joanne Graff Field in Tallahassee, a 3-0 lead for FSU, number 16 in the country. And the Seminoles are on top of South Alabama right now. Catherine Sandercock back to the circle. And we say hello to Coach Lonnie Alameda, the head coach of the Seminoles. Thanks for joining us here, Coach. And, you know, it's three early runs for your team after 35 and four games last weekend. What's working so well at the dish right now? Um, I mean, I just think they're implementing their plans. It's still early in the season, and everyone's excited to just get out and see someone different, you know. So I think we got some um, excitement, but, you know, but, you know, a lot of freshmen getting some looks, and it's good to see Janai getting out there. Mudge is just taking off from last year, and it's pretty cool to see her getting after some quality at bat. So it's been awesome. Yeah, Mudge has definitely improved her power game. When it comes to that large roster that you've got 27, how do you keep everybody happy and motivated to be able to come out with the right kind of attitude every day? Yeah, I mean, I think it's something you address in the beginning. I think uh, across the country, softball is going to have bigger rosters due to the COVID season, which is awesome for all of us because we're going to build a better game. You know, you have better opportunities to bring in people off the bench for defensive reasons or base running reasons or um, specialty matchups. And as long as that you're honest with your players in the beginning. So I think, uh, you know, of course, everyone in here wants to be starting, but, you know, got to keep that relationship building going and make sure that we are building the team um, to be the best team we can by, by the individuals. And so just honest relationships. And, and it's going to be a long season for a lot of us as coaches and players. Um, um, but in the end, I think the relationship is the biggest piece of it. All right, Coach Alameda, we'll let you go and call these pitches for Catherine right. Sandercock. Thanks <laughs> Thank for joining so us. Right. Coach A, always and a pleasure to talk with. Well, but it's the culture that she creates in communication. So you could even just see in her answer of those questions, she builds relationships no matter who she's talking to. She does a really good job of just communicating effectively with each of her players. And you also see her use red shirts to be able to postpone perhaps a player's season when she sees that they just need a little bit more development. So sometimes those freshmen coming in aren't just quite ready. And she uses 
the red shirt year communicates with them what it's for and she says we see dividends on that maybe not in the first year that they play but their junior and senior seasons that's where we see that true growth really kick in the culture becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy at some point at florida state you know she was saying that her team organized off-season meetings themselves this year and you know that's been a, a hallmark of the special teams they've had in the past is where they want to spend time together on and off the field. That's when you start to see something special. Yeah, the upperclassmen are truly tutoring the younger players as to what it means to be a Seminole. Catherine Sandercock back in the circle. Facing Caroline Nichols here. Count runs 3-0 and as Nichols tries to be the first Jaguar on base today. Slowing in, and the senior out of Hoover, Alabama, aboard first for USA. Yeah, the conversation from Coach Clark was they need to be in go mode, and you saw a lot of these Jaguar hitters chasing some pitches that maybe they shouldn't have, trying to be aggressive early in the count, but their patience pays off and gives the Jaguars their first base runner. Yeah, the tagline for South Alabama is all gas, no brakes. As Abby Allen lives it, swings at the first pitch, sends it to the gap in right center field. Nichols has speed in front of her, and she'll hold up at third. Two runners in scoring position for South Alabama with no outs here in the fourth. Well, you set that one up perfectly, Drew. All gas, but they did have to put the brakes on at third, so no run scored. But Abby Allen, the player last weekend with two extra base hits, the home run and the triple, now tacks on a double here in this game. Really good job of just staying, keeping her hands inside the ball, driving through the backside, putting this one in the gap. A stand-up double. And now for South Alabama, they've got two runners in scoring position. Brings in Camden Kavistad, tied for the all-time lead in home runs at South Alabama. Takes the first pitch on the inside edge. Kavistad with 28 career bombs, tied with Kristen Crocker and Caitlin Griffith for the most in program history. One on the ground foul. 0-2 hole for Kavistad against Katherine Sandercock. Not where you want to be. No, she'll definitely play with you when she gets ahead in the count like this. But when it comes to home run power, Kavistad has it. 10 home runs last season. You mentioned the 28 career home runs that she's got. But right now, she's just four away from her sister's career number. And I think she's going to bust out this year and break that record for their family. 0-2. Got her. Fifth strikeout of the day for Katherine Sandercock. Couldn't have come at a better time with two runners in scoring position. Yeah, that is the toughest pitch to foul off. That drop ball that's just under the hands of the hitter. It falls off the table. Great strikeout for Sandercock. That's a tough one for Kavista. When you get out early in the count, that's when it allows you to throw that drop ball with confidence as Kennedy Cronin fouls off the first pitch. And the thing about that drop ball on a power hitter, it's hard to get your barrel squared up to it to keep it fair. And even if Kavistad's able to square that one up, it's going to be a foul ball because it's in on the hands of the power hitter. So that's a great spot, even if you miss a little too far in. Great spot for Sandercock, and she's able to go there because she gets ahead in the count. Uh, levels at one for Cronin, who grounded out to Sandercock. Check that to Blankenship back in the first, or in the second inning. Two Jaguars in scoring position. Nichols at third, Allen at second. One one lifted left center. There's Kaylee Mudge who just moved over. 
Shows off that arm strength, but not in time as Nichols dashes home to score the first of the day for South. And Mudge isn't really known for the strong arm in the outfield. And in that one, I think I would have come up and really thrown hard to three. Instead of coming home with that, it was going to eventually be cut off anyway. But because the ball is lifted so well to the outfield, great sacrifice hit and put South Alabama on the board. Allen State put it second, brings in Victoria Ortiz off of Sandercock over to short. Blankenship has to sit on it. That's all gas, no breaks, jumping on the first pitch. Well, and that's what Coach Clark wanted him to do, be ready for every pitch. And if Sander Cock is going to leave one belt high, you better attack. And that's exactly what she did. Comes off the shin of Sander Cock in the circle, deflects over to blank and ship it short. There's no play to be made. A sharply hit ball does a really good job for South Alabama. And you can see it gives Coach Jeff out to the circle to be able to calm down the pitcher, Sander Cock. What has South Alabama done differently in the second trip through the order? I think nerves were a big part of it early on, right? You come into a big program like Florida State, you know that they're going to pitch you well. Sander Cox did a really good job of nipping corners early on. And South Alabama actually was chasing some pitches outside of the zone. This second time through, they've done a much better job of just swinging on pitches that have been a little bit of a mistake out of Sander Cox's hand. You see Sander Cock be the most effective when she gets ahead in the count. So they're attacking those pitches early and really taking advantage of a miscue early on with the leadoff walk to Nichols. No base runners in that first trip through the order. Now a walk, a double, a sack fly, and a single. Runners at the corners with Bell Wolfenden, the second baseman at the dish. Rounded toward third, Cheryl has it in time to first. That'll do it for the top of the fourth. South Alabama on the board thanks to Kennedy Cronin, sack fly, bringing home Caroline Nichols. SC Florida State takes a 3-1 lead to the bottom of the fourth over the visiting Jaguars of South Alabama, who just got on the board. First trip through the lineup, no base runners. Now they get a run in the top of the fourth as we welcome head coach Becky Clark onto the broadcast. Coach Clark, what was different in that second trip through the order? Uh, we swung the bat. You know, the first thing we were taking too many pitches, and that was something we talked about coming in, that she's not going to walk a lot of people. you got to be aggressive early. And we took too many pitches at the beginning, and then we settled down, um, started putting some balls in play. When you put balls in play, good things happen. I mean, that's what they're doing. They're putting balls in play. We have to, to match that. And one thing you talked to us about earlier this week was being in go mode, how last week that fell a little bit flat. How do you think that go mode is working for you right now? Well, it worked good in the fourth. We were in no mode in the first, <laughs> first, second, and third, and then we found we changed our end to a G. So now we're in go mode, and hopefully we can keep this thing rolling. From no mode to go mode. There you Hopefully go. it continues for you in <laughs> South Alabama. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, guys. Yeah, that had to be the, the most used phrase from our phone call, Jenny, was go mode for South Alabama. Fits in with their, their whole mantra of all gas, no brakes. Yeah, they, they like to put the pedal to the metal, make sure that they are the aggressor in the situation. And you did see them swing the bat early in the game in the first couple of innings. They just weren't chasing the right pitches. So a two-run lead for FSU as Michaela Edenfield, the catcher, digs in for the second time today against Jenna Hardy. O2 hole for the freshman. Edenfield who flashed that power last weekend. Yeah, Edenfield is stepping into some really big shoes to fill. I mean, Anna Shelnut, the catcher of note in the World Series, had been a staple in the program for several years. 
There's a frozen rope that's going to roll all the way to the wall. Edenfield going for two and is in standing up. And that's the kind of power that you like to see when you sit 0-2. A really good job of shortening up her swing and just driving this ball out to the gap. When we talked to Kocha about her, she said she's a four and a half to a player. And I didn't quite understand what that meant. She said, well, she'd be a five to a player, but she's just not quite fast enough. But there, able to leg out a stand-up double to lead off the inning. Oh, so close. Sometimes it's all about angles in the outfield. That one a little shallow. But infield starts the inning off with that stand-up double. And she is going to hit the dugout as pinch runner comes in for FSU, Deion Riggs. So four and a half tools for Michaela Edenfield. Not going to get a chance to show off that last half of the tool with the speed on the base path. We'll see if, if Riggs can beat her out there. <laughs> Bethany Keene takes strike one from Hardy. Like that Devin Flaherty now batting for FSU. All ACC player last year. Takes ball one, rolls to the backstop, and Riggs takes third base. Yeah, that's a cardinal sin for the catcher to let that ball get back to the backstop. A ball in the dirt instead of blocking this one up with a runner at second base. They're behind the dish. Vistad doesn't turn the glove over and allows a 60-foot advancement. Flaherty grounded out to the shortstop back in the second. Awaits the 2-1 from Hardy. Cut levels, 2-2. Riggs has a lot of speed over at third. Stole nine bases last year as a freshman. Flaherty takes, counts full. Pitch number 58 from Jenna Hardy. Flaherty fights it off and stays alive. You see in the emergence of the Florida Gulf Coast League in the summer where a lot of these collegiate players are going and being able to hone in on their skills, get some extra reps. Devin Flaherty was one of those players that took advantage of that opportunity and found herself as the Offensive Player of the Year in the league in 2021. Shoots that one through the gap. It's down for a base hit. Riggs will score and Flaherty has herself an RBI. I'm impressed with the way that these Seminoles are doing a great job of just shortening up their swings when they've got two strikes. They're a full count, able to punch this one out into left field. Does a really good job of just squaring up the ball and getting a run across. Down in the zone, doesn't try to do too much with it. Just slaps it out there into left. Really good job, scores the run. Makes it look easy, but I can tell you it is not. That pitch down and away, very hard to put a barrel on and square it up like that. That'll be the end of the day for Jenna Hardy for South Alabama. And Olivia Lackey will step to the circle for USA. She's fun to watch. Don't go anywhere. FSU leads 4-1. FSU leads by three thanks to the RBI single from Devin Flaherty who stands at first base and a new pitcher stands in the circle now for South Alabama. It is their top arm, their ace, Olivia Lackey, number 99. And if we were playing a video game, she might be 99 overall. She's that good for the Jaguars. What makes her so special, Jenny? 
You know, she's a power pitcher, and right now she's still getting her legs into strong season form where she has been known to throw upwards of 72 miles an hour. Right now she's sitting mid to upper 60s. Um, basically steps in with a screw, a curve, a rise, a drop, and at her best, her be she's at her best when her focus is her spin. But she can overthrow, the ball can sit flat. That leads to the long hit. So she's going to have to focus on that spin and make sure she nips corners to keep the ball away from the big bat of Florida State. Wacky first team all Sun Belt last year as a true freshman. First batters will face Bethany Keen. There goes Flaherty, who's a speed demon. Tried to take third, but has to crawl her way back to second after the dirt monster got her. <laughs> well, what happens sometimes is you get your spike stuck in your shoelace, and that's exactly what happened. She makes a good slide in, but as she gets to get up, the shoelace gets caught <laughs> in the spike. It rips it completely out of her shoe. So I, that should have been an additional 60 feet, but check out the shoelace as it flies behind her. That'll make a highlight reel, but not the kind she's looking to uh, put on ESPN for sure. <laughs> the hang time for the shoelace. And we've got aglets flying here at Joanne Graff Field. Here we 1-0 to Keene. Inside, got her. Not the start Olivia Lackey was looking for. Yeah, Devin Flaherty's got to be thinking, I lost my shoelace for nothing. I was going to be here anyway. <laughs> well, she gets the stolen base. She just doesn't get the additional 60 feet that would have put her, right. you know, so close to home. But honestly, you like that Lackey steps in and is trying to find her way through the zone. However, that pitch just gets away from her. You know, Lackey is the veteran on this staff. She's the workhorse, 194 and two thirds innings last year, 250 strikeouts, low ERA of just 2.34 last season. She's got to make sure that she keeps it tight on the zone though. These Florida State hitters are trained to know the strike zone. They will not swing out of the zone at these lackey pitches. Pinch hitter for FSU is Chloe Culp in the nine hole here for Brooke Blankenship with two runners on and none down in the fourth. Culp swings at the first pitch and lifts it out to left field. Welch is there and has it for USA and keeps the runners frozen at first and second. It is so hard to come off the bench. You haven't seen any pitches. You haven't been in the game defensively. Sometimes I'd like to tutor these young athletes to, when they step in to make sure that they have their timing down. Not always swing at that first pitch when you're coming in cold off the bench. Back to the top of the order for FSU. After Lackey recorded her first out. And here is that talented true freshman, Hallie Waycaser, retro freshman who Lonnie Alameda speaks so highly of. They love her game, a superstar back home in Centerton, Arkansas at Bentonville West High School. Yeah. One sky towards second. Wolfenden has it. Two down here on the bottom of the fourth. The difference between the two pitchers for South Alabama is we saw Hardy kind of fill in the bottom of the zone and now Lackey extending the zone up. And so you're seeing these Florida State hitters just a little bit under the ball. You've got to make sure that as you attack a pitcher that's throwing up in the zone that you keep the barrel above the ball on approach to be able to hit those line drives. Brings in Kaylee Mudge with two down. She has scored two of the four FSU runs. Walked in the first, stole second, came home to score, and hit a double in the third. Count one and one. So Jenny has a hitter, and you, when you see a new pitcher come in, and 
What, what's, what are you looking for, either in the on-deck circle or those first couple pitches at the plate? It's all about timing. I want to know, do you have an effective changeup that I need to worry about to disrupt my timing? And then I need to figure out what zone are you primarily looking to throw in. And right now, it looks like Lackey is filling the top of the zone. So as a hitter, you have to establish how high you need to keep your hands to be able to stay on top of that ball coming in, but also take advantage of those looks in the on-deck circle. Is she able to hit the top of the zone? Is the umpire calling the ball at the top of the zone? Remember, this umpire now has to adjust to a new look coming out of the circle as well. Both of the pitchers previous to this have been down in the zone. So where is the top of the zone going to be? Mudge jumps on the 3-1, out to right field, just foul. And she was right on that swing. It's just a matter of timing, just ahead of it. So that com communication going from base runners who are able to see the break of the pitches so close, right on the line. You mentioned it earlier, Drew, we do not have video replay in this one, but that would be a reviewable play if it was called fair on the field. 3-2. Ball four. Mudge draws her second walk of the day. Yeah, so a valuable piece to the puzzle was the communication right there from Flaherty to Mudge. Flaherty was out there at second base, was able to communicate to Mudge in that foul ball what she was seeing. So an opportunity to have communication now from batters to hitters, but also the top of the zone is where Lackey's trying to fill. You've got to be disciplined on that ball. Mac Leonard takes ball one. She also walked back in the first inning. The transfer from Illinois State has a lot of pop in that bat. At 425 with 10 dingers and 38 RBIs last year. And she's out ahead 2-0. 2-0 was my favorite pitch to unleash on, especially on a pitcher that knows that she's letting hitters go. A walk in the last at bat, you know she doesn't want to throw another ball, especially a pitcher that throws the up pitch. I'm hoping that she throws a little bit of a flat pitch into the zone that I can capitalize on, and that's what Leonard, big home run hitter, is looking for. Blackie finds the zone that time, 2-1. Lonnie Alamitas is... For Mac Leonard trying to fit into a really culture program. You've got different expectations here at FSU. Maybe a little overwhelming to start, but she's fitting in well now. Here's the 2-1. Up and in, 3-1 and one with the bases full. Remember, Mac Leonard is a pitcher herself, a two-way star at Illinois State. Cerebral in the box. Here's the 3-1. At the edge. Count runs full. Bases juiced with a full count. Swing and a miss. Olivia Lackey pumps it by Leonard and leaves the bases chucked in the bottom of the fourth. Lackey filling the top of the zone, making it dance away, comes away with a big strikeout with runners in scoring position, puts South Alabama in a position to strike back and try to even things up. Four innings in the books at Joanne Graff Field in Tallahassee. Hot start for Florida State. Kaylee Harding puts the Knowles on the board. Big hit, two RBIs. Swing, but then in the fourth, South Alabama able to come away with a sack fly of their own. Maybe Cronin, big RBI, gets South Alabama to get rid of the goose egg. But Florida no. State would not be silenced. Tons of hitting, more runs, but Katherine Sandercock had been the item of note in this one. Doing such a good job of just filling the bottom of the zone. Strikeouts everywhere. Curveball, screwball, drop ball. Sandercock dealing. Sandercock was perfect in her first trip through the order. No base runners in the first three innings for South Alabama. 
But a leadoff walk led to a run for the Jags in the top of the fourth. That's how we got here. 4-1 FSU leads in their fifth game of the season. Drew Carter, Jenny Dalton-Hill with you. Excited to be watching this Seminoles team that went all the way to the Women's College World Series Championship Series last year. Second time in the last three tournaments they've been there. They won it all in 2018. Only ACC team to do so. Made it back to the big stage last season. With some extra pop in this lineup, FSU could find themselves right back where they were last year. Yeah, Florida State had to redefine their offensive production last season and did so at just the right time. Made a huge run through the Women's College World Series. Won the first game against Oklahoma. Pushed that, if necessary, third game. Couldn't find a way to come away with the win. One of the things that Coach Lonnie Alameda said about that run through the World Series was they couldn't even really celebrate. COVID made them go back to the bus, and so it's been kind of hard to have those conversations about how proud she is of these of those athletes because the celebration just kept being pushed back and pushed off their rings they thought they were going to be able to have a celebration in October but the rings weren't even ready in October so they've just had opportunities to continue to celebrate that great run and they surprised them with rings a couple weeks ago and talk about delayed gratification eight months later <laughs> your recognition making it all the way to the championship series. Count is two and two. Sander Cock against Bailey Welch. Stays alive. By the way, new catcher for FSU is Kyle Lapresti behind the dish. A junior out of Brandon, Florida. And it's the depth for FSU. They've got the redshirt freshman, Michaela Edenfield, who's so talented. He's now started all five games to catch her. Bringing Lapresti here in the fifth. Another 2-2. Two -two. Blowing in from Sander Cockett at bat here for Bailey Welch. Welch 0 for 1 with a strikeout. Payoff pitch from Sandercock, dribbled toward the right side. There's Bethany Keen who gobbles it up and puts it away for the first out in the top of the fifth. We're going to see these Seminoles this weekend. St. Pete Clearwater Invitational showcases the 16 softball teams and 40 great, great games across the networks of ESPN. And it starts tomorrow morning. It's finally here. That's right. We're featuring this game on ACC Network. Saturday, though, number 13 Michigan takes on number six Florida State at 1 Eastern. Tiffany Green, Madison Shipman on the call there. That one and 39 other games are going to be streaming live on the ESPN app. So much good softball. And we talked with Coach Alameda about focusing on this game when you've got that right around the corner. After this, they're heading down to the Tampa Clearwater area. And she mentioned the acronym that's at the heart of this program, which is GATE, give your all to the team every day with the emphasis being on that E every day. You can't look ahead. Yeah, this is kind of a trap game. South Alabama, a very good squad. You can't look past them knowing that you've got some big games coming up in St. Pete. But you mentioned Michigan. I mean, Big Ten finally able to play somebody outside of just Big Ten <laughs> opponents. Last year in COVID, they didn't get to play anybody outside of their conference until it got to the postseason. Michigan lost a heartbreaker to Florida last week. One pitch, grand slam, 4 nothing loss. Excited to see how uh, they're able to show up this next weekend. Yeah, Michigan, we talked with Carol Hutchins a couple weeks ago, and he said they've barely been able to play at all because it's been so cold up north. That's a live ball for South Alabama and Meredith Keel. It was off the glove of Sidney Sherrill. Kiel's at first base right now. Cheryl's in disbelief. Yeah, so video replay not in this game. But you can clearly see that Cheryl was diving beyond the line. And it's where the ball is touched in terms of 
where it is over the field, where it is touched. That call is made by the home plate umpire. He calls that a fair ball. Now Becky Clark having a conversation with Don Brown. Well, and the only reason she'd be having a conversation is if he called it a foul ball after he called it a fair ball, so. And again, no replay or review here. We're going to see some replay review this season. It's a big storyline in the sport, but not here. So Brown changes his mind. You know, I don't know about you, Jenny, but on, on initial, on the initial look, I was thinking there's no way that was a fair ball. <laughs> Actually, on the replay, it might have been. It was kind of iffy. Well, and in, when there is replay, I actually would be okay with them calling this a fair ball because then play isn't killed and you can continue with the play. But if then you go to replay, see it's foul ball, you just bring the batter back. So with replay, that's an easier call to be able to call fair and then go back and revisit. But in that situation, as soon as he says foul ball, we're done. And, and that's kind of why replay review is so widely supported in the game. Something like that, I mean, why why just guess based on what you think you saw when we have all these great looks at it? Why not go back and look at it? Here's the one, two to Keel. Stays alive again. Well, and I think a lot of viewers may not understand what responsibilities that home plate umpire has. He has a slapper up to the plate who he has to watch her feet as well as the pitch, as well as call ball and strikes, and also fair and foul down the lines. So he's got a lot of responsibility on what he needs to be finding and calling on every single pitch. Two got her. Sandercock punches out Keel here in the top of the fifth. Yeah, drop ball dominant, definitely living at the bottom of the zone for a slapper. That inside ball, as you try to run through this, connect with it out in front, just falls off the table. Six strikeout today. Mackenzie Brasher tried to slap it right off in front of the dish. Strike one. I like that approach by Brasher as well. Last week at LSU, the ground in front of home plate is very hard, and these slappers for South Alabama were not utilizing it. They were hitting line drives and trying to lift the ball over the shortstop. But there, I like the approach of Brasher trying to use the ground, push it into the ground, and let her wheels get down the line. Down 0-2 now against Sandercock. Six strikeouts for the senior out of Virginia. The 0-2. Aside from that fourth inning, Sandercock has been perfect. One, two. Going outside again, Brasher hanging. And we mentioned how fast she is, but it really comes down to swinging at good pitches. And they're showing a great disciplined eye, even though she's fallen down on the count. She's been strong enough to be able to get it back to even. Uh, 
Fouled off her foot. It's got to give you flashbacks, right, Jenny? You must have done that a few times. More than once, but it comes down to just walking it off. That one, luckily, she was running through, and so it wasn't like it was a solid front side that she hit into. But yeah, a drop inside leaves you vulnerable to fouling it off of your foot. And when you've got a hitter like Brasher who uses her wheels to be successful, you want to make sure that that's uh, feeling good before you step back into the box. Brief infield conference in the circle for FSU. 67 pitches for Kat Sandercock. Here comes 68. Dribbled to second. Gobbled up by Flaherty. And that'll do it for the top of the fifth. Seminoles still lead by three. Heart of the order coming up. Harding, Cheryl, Hedenfield. Bald men on campus. Every Friday night, Jay Billis, LaFonso Ellis, Seth Greenberg preview the ACC slate of weekend games and have the latest news from around the conference. Only on ACC Network and the ESPN app. I don't see any bald men in that scenic of FSU's campus. They might be hiding in the bushes over there, but definitely check out Bald Men on Campus. As Jay Billis says, you know, it's really one of the hot shows on television right now. We'll see if we can get an update on whether Scott Van Pelt is going to join the program anytime sooner if he's too cool for bald men. Back here at Joanne Graff Field, fifth inning. Underway for FSU, led off by Kaylee Harding, the cleanup hitter. Jumped on the first pitch from Olivia Lackey, just foul. Yeah, she's trying to put the exclamation point on, hey, it's not basketball season, right? We're playing softball, but basketball-centric, bald men on campus. We'll give them 30 minutes. We'll give them 30 minutes. <laughs> this time, Harding keeps it between the lines. Out to left, Bailey Welch has it for South Alabama, one down. Now batting number 24, Cindy this, I got to say, Jenny, there's, there's room for everyone here. There's room for basketball. There's room for softball. Plenty of hours here on our ESPN family of networks. There's definitely room, but this weekend I will be on the couch or behind this monitor watching softball. <laughs> constantly 40 games this weekend coming at you you and me both and it all culminates with ucla and these fsu seminoles on espn one not espn two espn regular here's sydney Sherrill. that'll stay in the infield for the shortstop kennedy cronin two down Check out the Seminoles here. It does not get any easier for FSU in the non-conference schedule. Head down to St. Pete, Clearwater area. Every team is ranked that they're going to play. That is pretty standard for this Invitational. Yeah, some teams stack the beginning of the season to be able to push their RPI up, knowing that when they get into the regular season in their conference, they are going to need that help in terms of ranking come postseason but when you're Florida State and you're playing in the ACC this year you don't need that RPI help but what you are doing is forging a team that is postseason ready this is Kyle Lepresti first at bat of the day after she came in for Michaela Edenfield behind the dish it's a really good point Jenny about the strength of the ACC and what that's going to do for these teams come tournament time they don't usually have a lot of hosts of regionals, but that could change as the ACC gains more respect nationwide. Lepresti lifts it, left side, and it's another put out for Kennedy Cronin and South Alabama. We'll sing the praises of the ACC next. Didn't get a chance to do it in the bottom of the fifth. Top six on the way and the top of the order coming up for USA. Catherine Sandercock has pitched five innings. Four of them have been perfect. First trip through the lineup. No base runners for South Alabama today. Sandercock looking like the same pitcher she was last year, one of the best players in the Women's College World Series. Yeah, drop ball and screw ball have been on point. Filling the zone, nipping corners, and being able to get under the bat of the big hitters for South Alabama. Six strikeouts on the day for Sandercock in the circle. Is a key cog for the Seminoles team, which 
A lot of people expect to maybe be back where they were last season. Up, Sander Cock Three. last year, a first team all ACC team or three complete games in the NCAA tournament, one at each stage of the big dance in the regional, the super regional and the World Series. And you see today, aside from that top of the fourth, when the Jacks had six base runners and they scored their only run of the day, she has been flawless. Well, and that hiccup happened in the fourth because of a leadoff walk to Caroline Nichols. That walk doesn't happen. It doesn't get in her head, and the rest of the inning perhaps is different. So walks, got to keep them away, and those free passes, she does not give up very many. Last year, Sander Cock only gave up 28 walks on the season in 178 and two-thirds innings. Go with 127 strikeouts. Just missed inside to Caroline Pepper Nichols, the leadoff hitter for the Jags, who is 0 for 1 today with a strikeout and a walk. In there, one and two. In case you weren't with us earlier, Caroline Nichols is nicknamed Pepper because she had a Dr. Pepper t-shirt she wore for about a week straight when she was younger, and it has stuck all the way to her college days. I don't know if there's a salt on this South Alabama roster, but they do have a pepper at the top of the order. I wonder if she walks around going, Lil Sweet. I'm just saying, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, I have so much respect for that. I, I saw you gearing up for it. I saw you gearing up for it, and I'm so happy you went for it. That's It's pretty good. Those are some pretty funny commercials. Yeah. Counts level at two. Upstairs, three and two. Did you know that Little Sweet is actually uh, Justin Guarini, who I think was the runner-up in American Idol in the first season? Yes. Yeah. yeah. To Kelly it's a little Clarkson. throwback. Yeah, I think so. I think so. He had better hair back then. He's okay. smaller now, though, Lil Sweet. 3-2. <laughs> well, just like Lil Sweet, Caroline Nichols not intimidated either. I mean, she's one of those hitters that you put at the top of the lineup. She is a senior on this squad. She's hitting 500 coming out of last weekend. Does a really good job of just keeping the barrel on the zone. As a slapper, though, I'd really like to see her use the ground more rather than elevating the ball by keeping the barrel flat through the zone. Payoff pitch. That one is chopped. Man, she's got speed and she's safe. Pretty quick turn from Devin Flaherty at second, but the 5 1 Pepper Nichols beats it out. Well, and that's what you have to do as a slapper you have to use the ground. Typically, if you can get the ground, the ball to hit the ground twice as a slapper, you can make it on base. And there hits those two bounces. As a second baseman, it's a tough play, but you've got to try to pick up the ball before it hits the ground that second time to turn over to first base. Abby Allen in, bloops it over to first, and the catch by Bethany Keene. So one pitch, one out against Allen, maybe the most dangerous bat in this USA lineup. I had a big double in her last at bat. But the South Alabama team has done a pretty good job of making adjustments off of Sander Cock. Sander Cock has not elevated in the zone. I think we've only seen one rise ball in this whole game. Another first pitch swing for Camden Kavistad. Out to right field. Harding has it. And Nichols has to retreat to first base. You don't want to test Kaylee Harding's arm out in right field. She had a top 10 throw last weekend against Loyola Chicago. I think she made top 10 in the College World Series last year as well. It, it looked like the same play, honestly, just eight months apart. Fly ball out to right. Not only is it a tough catch to make, she's got to cover a lot of ground, but she comes up with a cannon of a throw over to third base. Sydney Sherrill applies the beautiful tag. I mean, you don't hit to Harding and expect to advance from second to third. Typically, on most teams, you do. A ball to right, oh, I got this. Not against Harding. I don't know if Mike Norvell was watching that replay, but if you need someone under center, Harding has an absolute howitzer of an arm and right. 
Yeah, and can throw on the run too, right? Like, doesn't yeah. just sit in the pocket with an arm, but can go ahead and move, throw on the run, change the arm angle, find a different yep. slot. Nice. Flip the hips. She's got oily hips. Throw across the body. I mean, you name a football buzzword, we've got it. 1-1. <laughs> one, one. Kennedy Cronin is down in a 1-2 hole. Senior out of Daphne, Alabama in the Mobile area. Playing for her hometown Jags. Six strikeouts already for Kat Sandercock. 81st pitch of the day. Cronin drove in the only run of the game. Back in the fourth on a sack fly to center. Another 1-2 on the way. Little fake by Lopresti back there behind the dish because of the wheels over there at first. But with two outs, runner at first, Sandercock really needs to attack this batter. Cronin led the team in RBIs two times. Most doubles on the team last year with 13. It's a very dangerous hitter for South Alabama up to bat. Cronin gets a piece again. We saw the Jags in the dugout having fun over there. That's one reason why this sport is such a blast to watch and cover. That is a live dugout over there. I don't know what they're doing per se, but hearts. it's fun. It's hearts. Hearts all around. Yeah, Valentine's Day gotta, just passed. You got to shake your twos now. Two and two count, two outs. Got her. But she got a piece, though. And Cronin stays alive. Lepresti was ready to apply the tag and head back to the dugout. Yeah, all, it, with two outs, yes, first base is occupied. I did not see it. I, I didn't hear it either, but luckily back there behind the dish, home plate umpire heard that tip. She stays alive. Pitch number 85 coming up for Kat Sandercock. Good eye. Runner goes, and Pepper Nichols is in there safely. Yeah, if you're going to advance, you have to do it on either a changeup or a ball in the dirt. It makes it hard for the transition for the catcher. Really good job recognizing that ball in the dirt. Lepresti comes away with a good throw, but the speed down there, a little too much to handle. Great at bat here for Kennedy Cronin. Works the count full. Got her! Strikeout number seven for Katherine Sandercock. That drop ball down and in under the power hitter's hand. It's a tough one to catch up to, and Sandercock loves to fill the zone down there under the hand. Strikeout number seven. We're excited about those umbrellas, and we're also excited about this. Monday, the tournament, a history of ACC men's basketball, continues on ACC Network. Episode 5 highlights 1975 to 1980 at 9 Eastern, followed by Episode 6, which breaks down 81 to 83. New episodes of the 10-part documentary available every Monday at 9 and 10 Eastern through March 7th. You can always watch past episodes on the ESPN app. It's a two-for-one, episode five and six on Monday. So if you watched episode one, you'd know the answer to this question. When did the tournament, the ACC tournament, begin, Drew? Do you know? Oh, Jenny, put me on the spot like this. I'm just going to call the game. That's Devin Flaherty <laughs> with a chopper to second base, and that's the first out here on the bottom of the sixth. I did actually, I watched a promo for the first episode of the tournament. I'm going to guess 1954? You got it. Tabbed it. That's exactly right. And the team with the most championships in the ACC, I think everybody in the country knows it's Duke, right? With 21. Wait, are you kidding me? Did I actually get that right? You got it spot on. Yeah. Oh, my it. gosh. 
Wow, I did not know that. About a, I know everybody's worried about Mike Krzyzewski. Left the game on Tuesday, did not return back to the court after halftime, so hoping that he's okay. Yeah, that was a great game against Wake Forest. The Demon Deacons came all the way back, tied it up at 74 late. Mark Williams with a putback to win it. Duke's dangerous, carrying the torch for the ACC this year. This is Bethany Keene at the dish for FSU. Against Liv Lackey, back out there for her third inning of work for USA. Keene the transfer from South Florida. Spent five years with the Bulls. Great defensive first baseman, as the coaches here really excited. And remember, Keene was the first batter that Lackey faced coming out of the pen, and so let the ball slip out of her hand, hit Keene to start off her outing here today. But right now doing a really good job. Got a piece of that one all the way to the backstop, and Keene is safe at first. Good to be good, and it's also good to be lucky. Sometimes when you swing at a pitch that is not a strike, you get to hang your head and go back to the dugout. But this one gets away from the catcher, Kvistad. And because of that, Keen's able to hustle her way down to first base, heads up base running, gets her down there. No play made on it. Little redemption after a bad swing. Amaya Ross will pinch run over at first. Freshman who's got really a Seminole in her blood. A lot of her family played football at FSU, including her dad, Gerard. A lot of speed over at first. Brooke Blankenship takes first pitch up high. And Ross is safe at second. Another stolen bag for the Seminoles. Grand Larceny continues. You might as well just put that one on repeat because this Seminole offense is going to steal bases all year long. So much speed able to come off the bench. Another swipe. Or strike one from Lackey to Blankenship. Back in there after she batted in the second inning. And Chloe Culp came in. Count runs to one and two, and Blankenship arrived with a bang last weekend. Hit 500 across those four games. Also went yard, one of six Seminoles to do so. Yeah, we see her playing shortstop here today. Josie Muffley was the shortstop last year that took them through the Women's College World Series. When it comes to the future of the middle infield, Blankenship is definitely part of that. She played all four games last weekend. Blankenship, the true freshman out of Hudson, Florida, on 2-2. Lifts that one to center field. Brasher has it for USA. Two down, bottom six. Yeah, that was a really good pitch to attack. The diff the problem was on approach, she dropped her hands before she went to attack. Because of that, Barrel was below the ball on approach. Lift that into outfield. Back to the top of the lineup for Hallie Wakecaser, another freshman on this FSU roster. This could be a glimpse of the future in the Seminoles program if Waycaser could bring in Amaya Ross. It's something we say a lot over the next three to four years. Count 2-0 and oh against Olivia Lackey, the top pitcher for South Alabama. You see Amaya Ross, the true freshman out of Jacksonville. Mentioned her dad, Gerard, played football at FSU, won a national championship, went on to play for the Seahawks. Two cousins also played football for the Knowles. And a brother played at FSU, another cousin, I should say, played baseball at FSU. So Amaya Ross has family ties to this college, for sure. I don't know that she could have gone anywhere else, even if she had wanted to. 2-1, sent foul by Waycaser, 2-2. It's 
It's reached the point in Tallahassee where this softball program is just as prestigious as the football program, the baseball program, the hoops program, the New Bloods. The Waycaser goes down swinging there as Lackey punches her out to end the sixth inning. Last chance for USA when we come back. Five, six, seven due for the Jags. Down three. Nothing going for the Noles there. The bottom of the sixth. Seventh inning on the way in Tallahassee. And speaking of seven innings, you got to check out ESPN's flagship podcast for college softball. First episode of the season just dropped. Refresh your Spotify or your Apple podcast. You'll see that seven innings is back for the 2022 season. Go check it out. Look ahead to St. Pete, Clearwater, Elite Invitational. Conference previews going around the country. Folks, it's not just an SEC Pac-12 sport anymore. No, no, no. We got ACC. We got to talk about Big Ten. It's all good. And then, of course, shagging stats. Jenny Dalton Hill, part of that podcast, as always. Got to be fun Number to get back behind the mic with, with everyone, right? Well, it's, it's like a family reunion, right? Like everybody leaves the Women's College World Series and then we text each other. But then it's all of a sudden nine faces on the podcast. It's hard to uh, get a word in sometimes because we all <laughs> just have so much to say. I was going to ask, do you guys like record the segment separately or are you all on Zoom at the same time? All on Zoom at the same time. It's a tricky uh, little navigation. Robin Segretti this year is our producer of that show, did a really good job of helping us navigate who spoke when. Emma Wilson is out there for the seventh inning for FSU after six strong from Kat Sandercock. One run and three hits allowed by the starting pitcher for FSU. Seven strikeouts and a walk in six innings. Here is Wilson, the transfer from Louisville. Counts one and one against Victoria Ortiz, the right fielder for South. What are we seeing here from Emma Wilson? Yeah, Emma Wilson is very similar to Katherine Sandercock. She lives down in the zone, away to right-handed batters, relies on a curve, really nice spin to it. But that drop ball will fill the bottom of the zone, just like Sandercock. She's worked this offseason to develop her changeup and her rise. But when it comes right down to it, she just needs more experience. And so I like this shift in the pitching circle by coach Lonnie Alameda to be able to give her another inning. She's got a three run cushion and able to just use her pitches, try to get the win for Florida State. Counts full against Ortiz. I misspoke, not the transfer from Louisville. We got all our notes here, still getting in the rhythm of the season. I meant to say she hit a three run home run at Louisville last season and her only hit with FSU. So Wilson can do both. Mainly a pitcher. 3 2 against Ortiz. We talked earlier about the big roster that Florida State has. Emma Wilson, actually in her freshman season, chose to register. Coach Alameda talked to her, told her that, you know, ahead of her in the circle, there were a lot of strong arms. And so that conversation became, we will need you later. So go ahead and give us a, a, a red shirt year to start your career here. And now you're starting to see that payoff. That was Autumn Belvi in left field, making the catch for the first out. Out now 1-0 to Bell Wolfenson. You know, Wilson with the red shirt, and same kind of thing happening this year for FSU. Ali Dubois, the three-time Patriot League Pitcher of the Year from Boston University, likely redshirting this year, according to Coach A. So, so much depth. It is a good thing, but, I mean, if you're, if you're a pitcher for FSU, sometimes you got to wait your turn. Well, and it's not so much about waiting. It's about development as well. Getting on campus, learning how things are taught, being able to develop pitches, develop spins, develop routines. Wolfenden drills this one left center. Mudge is back, can't haul it in. Wolfenden still on her horse. And we'll 
hold up at third. So with one down here on the top of the seventh, Bell Wolfenden almost left the yard. He stands 90, 60 feet away from giving South Alabama another run. Well, it looks like that's go mode to me. When, it, when we talked to Coach Clark, she said they needed to be in go mode. This pitch is left right down Main Street. Because of that, Wolfenden able to capitalize and realize now Mudge not in left field. They've made some defensive shifts as well. So Mudge not used to center field, not used to the depth of the fence there. Sometimes new real estate is difficult in the outfield. So Mudge misplays that ball off the wall and now puts South Alabama within 60 feet of another run. This is Bailey Welch for USA. She swings, hits it high. There's Sid Sherrill, sure-handed at third base for the second out. Instead of Meredith Keel for South Alabama in this eight hole, it is Stephanie Gonzalez, the freshman out of Pembroke, Florida. Wilson's first pitch upstairs. Jumps on that, deep center field, it's gone! And we have a one-run game. All gas, no breaks indeed. Gonzalez's first swing of the game sends it over the fence. Yeah, how do you make a starting lineup, Drew? You hit like that, coming cold off the bench in the top of the seventh inning with a runner in scoring position. This is where Emma Wilson does get herself into trouble. She leaves the ball up in the zone. And Gonzalez able to capitalize, keeping her barrel right on plane with this one. Coming up, sending it deep. And now South Alabama within just one run. Kenzie Brasher up next, the nine hole hitter for USA. Second team all Sun Belt Conference last year, 0 for 2 today with a couple of ground outs. And the temperature at Joanne Graff Field has changed a lot. The complexion of the game has changed a lot. A one from Wilson. Brasher went around, 0 and 2. I think this is a really good call. Broke the plane of the plate. Offered at it. Umpire called that one very well. Wilson's 0-2. And you do like to have your slappers keep their hands inside the ball on approach, but what you're seeing out of Brasher right now is while she keeps her hands inside, she's allowing the barrel to drop down as well back behind. She's got to keep that barrel tall on approach. 0-2 oh, down low, 1-2. and two. Wilson pitched twice over the weekend. Five strikeouts and six and two-thirds. One, two. Ground it to second. Flaherty's on it. Over to Keene, and that will do it. Got a little dicey there at the end, but FSU hangs on and stays unbeaten in 2022. Catherine Sandercock, really good job in the circle, filling the bottom of the zone, letting her defense work for her. Ton of strikeouts for her on the day. This Florida State team looks ready to go into St. Pete.